What's up, guys? It's Friday, February 19th, 2021, and you're listening to Fritz Cast. This week, I have a very, very special guest, former state senator from Maine, Eric Brakey, who's also YAL's current policy advisor and a wealth of other political knowledge. And uh, Eric is snowed in in Texas in that lovely mess. And so... <laughs> Uh, at first, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get away with uh, with doing it, uh, but we, we, we pulled it off. We got it done, and uh, it's a great interview where we get to talk about even uh, even an unexpected topic that I wasn't expecting to talk about, uh, power, energy, energy generation, energy uh, crises, because he's snowed in in Texas. He's experiencing firsthand some of the, uh, some of the energy problems going on. Uh, in Texas, so we talk a little bit about that. We talk a little bit about his history, uh, this this debate that he just had with Dave Smith over whether uh, building up and overtaking a Libertarian Party is is an effective strategy or taking over the Republican Party as Liberty Republicans as Ron Paul Ron Paul Republicans uh, is is a good idea or not? Um, and I think it's just it's a wealth of of great discussion. Uh, so you know, tighten your seatbelts and get ready for it. Uh, I do want to make uh, a couple of notes, too, coming up uh, um, it, it, tomorrow night, in fact. I'm going to be sitting down and recording uh, an episode with the Joshua Smith, uh, who is just, he's a great guy. He's run for LNC chair before. He's very, uh, very uprising, prominent voice in the uh, libertarian movement. And we're going to talk a little bit about his upcoming podcast break the cycle among other topics as well um there's going to be a lot to talk about and unpack there and uh brian nichols we're we're hammering out when we're going to do brian nichols uh because brian me and brian have gone back and forth we thought about doing it this week but it's just not going to cut it uh this week uh but uh you guys have reached out since last episode with the mises caucus the mises caucus i don't know mises caucus i don't know um you guys have reached out from the last episode, and you've rather enjoyed that content as well. So I thank you guys for reaching out and and watching that. And uh, so w- without further ado, though, let's get to Eric Brakey. Let's get to the interview right now on FritzCast. <laughs> Eric Brakey, welcome to FritzCast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me from this uh, very thrown together recording studio in the middle of the Texas blizzards and everything else. So glad to be on with you. Yeah, glad to have you. And how how is Texas right now? Because I'm hearing a lot of bad stuff. I'm hearing people are snowed in. I'm hearing about rolling blackouts <laughs> and all that stuff. I mean, tell me a little bit about what's going on in Texas. Well, things are pretty crazy down here. Um, I know at 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 our home, uh, we've been at, had no power for the last uh, uh, the last couple of days. Uh, you know, temperatures close to zero. Uh, it's been pretty bad. Um, thankfully, you know, some of our um, work colleagues have power, and they offered a whole bunch of folks to pile into them. So, um, my wife and I have been here the last few days. We're making the most of it, but. Uh, it's really, I mean, a real failure of the Texas energy system, and it's kind of crazy to see all these frozen windmills. Yeah, yeah. How well, that worked well, out. Yeah, I was going to say before I even dive into a little bit of your history and all that, you've you've kind of been going on a Twitter tirade about that. Let's just let's touch up on that a little bit. What what is the what's what's the deal with the energy in in Texas right now? Because I understand a little bit of it, but I don't know the whole picture. Yeah, so as best as I understand it, and you know, I really have tried to do some independent research and not just kind of buy into you know the typical kind of political narratives that people try to push. You know, first I saw people coming out and saying, "Look, oh, these windmills, have, you know, frozen. The windmills have have failed us," and that seemed, you know, I've I've never been a, a fan of wind power for so many reasons. Um, but then I heard kind of the the some of the arguments coming out saying, well, that's a little misguided. It's not just the wind that failed. Look, it's the whole system that wasn't uh, prepared for winter. Look, you had natural gas pipelines that froze and natural gas wasn't able to do everything it needed to do. 
and that's true too. Um, but what I've but what's interesting is to see when you actually peel back the numbers. Um, there were shortages in natural gas, uh, but the energy that we do have, uh, especially the energy going to critical areas like hospitals, is pretty much all coming from natural gas, coal, and nuclear power. Uh, now, it's not at the levels as we would like to have, but there is energy coming from these sources, where pretty much 100% of the wind turbines have failed. So uh, folks can say there were failures all around. That's true. Natural gas, uh, perhaps the pipeline should have been weatherized better, uh, but, uh, but nothing failed as much as the wind turbines failed. Wow. Do, do you think that's a testament to um, when people talk about like this push for, for green energy and renewable energy? Do you think that's kind of a testament to how we have to utilize things that we have in place right now before we can transition over and rely on other methods? I think that a lot of folks have, uh, you know, I think oftentimes coming from very well-meaning places, but I think they have a very kind of pie in the sky attitude about how we actually fix uh, these problems. I think we all want a cleaner environment. We all want, uh, uh, you know, sustainable energy. Um, frankly, I think if that's what we're really interested in, we need to be developing nuclear power is the one technology that exists that can actually help get us there. Um, but I think that people have these romantic notions of wind power and solar power, and they don't understand the actual uh, science and technology of it to understand that these are very unreliable sources of energy. And the idea that we're going to be able to pow power American civilization on windmills is it's crazy. And it doesn't reflect uh, actually it doesn't reflect the technology as it is right now. Uh, I would certainly agree with you, especially on a large scale, like on a grid powering whole cities. Like if you're talking about solar, I think solar is more like you can confine it to a home. You can have it power a home or like one building, but not an entire city, not an entire grid. Mm. That makes sense. Well, I think, yeah. And I think one of the things with solar, and I will say, I, I think solar probably in the long run will uh, have a bigger role in our energy future than wind power will, um, it, you know, except for perversions by, you know, tax subsidies and, and, and cor uh, corporate welfare kind of, you know, boosting, boosting wind power. But, um, but really, you know, the, the, the big problem at the end of the day with both of these power sources is that um, when we generate energy is when we have to use the energy. Uh, and and wind and and solar being um, uh, you know it's very much dependent on the state of the weather at the time whether or not you're drawing energy from these things. Uh, wind in particular, it tends to be windier in the evenings when you need energy less uh, and you're operating in non-peak hours. So uh, it's it's very mismatched in a lot of ways. Uh, if we had better battery technology, and we you own know, folks like Elon Musk have been trying to work on that battery technology, we'll see, see where that goes. That opens potentially some new possibilities for the future. But uh, as of right now, where we have a system where you've got to use the energy as you produce the energy, uh, wind power especially is uh, just very problematic. Yeah, yeah, pie in the sky for sure. So uh, let's talk a little bit about yourself now. We're doing this backwards. Talk a little bit about who you are. <laughs> And what you do and, and what you have done, because you have been an elected official as a state senator. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, I'm Eric Brakey. I am, um, I've been in the liberty movement for about 10 years now, ever since I was just a grassroots liberty activist in 2010 in the Tea Party wave who realized that the, the typical establishment neoconservative narrative that was sold to us on Fox News was a bunch of lies. Uh, and that this Ron Paul guy made a whole bunch of sense if we actually believed what we said we believed, that we wanted limited constitutional government, that we wanted to cut spending. He was the only guy with an actual plan to do anything, uh, and he was consistent. So I became a Ron Paul supporter, just became a grassroots ac activist showing up at a local events, helping out with things. Before I knew it, I'd off been offered a job on the Ron Paul campaign. Uh, moved to my uh, back to my home state of Maine, where my family's been for generations. Uh, became the state director there, one of the states that we won. 
went on, ran for state Senate, served two terms there, got a lot of things passed like constitutional carry, welfare reform, right to try, a big expansion of medical cannabis, even the legalized uh, uh, the ownership of hedgehogs as pets. That one was oh, wow. for some sixth grade constituents who uh, wanted their hedgehog freedoms back. But that's a proud accomplishment, too. But I was the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in Maine in, in 2018. I uh, ran for Congress this past this past year in 2020, uh, though uh, came up against some big neocon opposition in the primary. Uh, and now I'm working with Young Americans for Liberty because uh, this is an organization that I see that's really uh, making liberty win by by taking a lot of the grassroots energy in our movement and channeling it towards you know productive, winnable fights. Uh, getting folks elected to the state legislatures across the country. In fact, this last election cycle, we got 123 Ron Paul style legislators elected to state capitals in 37 states, uh, which is nothing like we've ever seen before. So, uh, you know, we're making some great progress in the liberty movement, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. No, and that's that's quite a resume to be carrying with you and especially into Young Americans for Liberty, because they've definitely proven, at least on, on groundwork at state and local levels, that they've got the uh, they, they've got what it takes to accomplish these victories and all that. Uh, part part of me uh, was very interested. I think it was about a week ago or so uh, you uh, you went on Lions of Liberty with Dave Smith and talked about strategies and whether it was, you know, uh, uh, building a libertarian party or a third party wave to accomplish this or accomplishing it through YAL's method of, of doesn't really matter if you're Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter your party, it matters your principles. Um, what, what are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously, the libertarian party has uh, shortcomings when it comes to grabbing electoral victories, strategy and all that. And YAL obviously has the capabilities of really targeting races that they believe are winnable and, and using money wisely at that. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Um, so I think you kind of really hit on something there is that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we are electing people who believe in liberty as Republicans as Democrats, as libertarians, the party affiliation doesn't matter. What matters is the underlying principles and what people are going to fight for. Now, I've yet to I've yet to meet someone who uh, was running as a Democrat who is really a libertarian and had a path to victory. I've yet to see that, uh, but I have seen a lot of folks running as Republicans, uh, myself included. I had my own experience with this when I ran for state senate in 2014 as a Republican. Uh, winning uh, winning r races and getting elected and making liberty policy happen. Um, my uh, my debate that I had with Dave Smith, and let me say up front that I, I um, have a lot of respect for Dave. I'm a regular listener of his show, and uh, and I think ideologically we're very much in alignment. But my my concern is that I think so many folks are putting so much time and energy into going this third party route through the Libertarian Party when we live in a two-party system, which we can you know, say it's not fair that we live in a two-party system and that we want to change that, but you can't change that unless you actually win the elections to be in a position to change those things. So we can put all this time and energy into trying to take over the Libertarian Party and make it more Libertarian, but uh, but ultimately, it's like conquering a molehill. Nobody really cares at the end of the day. The establishment in Washington, Washington D.C. certainly doesn't care if we take over the Libertarian Party because it's not a threat to them. But what is a threat to them is when we challenge their hold over the Republican Party, which, uh, which I've been uh, helping to do. I've been working with grassroots people across the country for the last 10 years. Uh, we effectively, in 2012, we took over the main Republican Party uh, that same year. The Ron Paul movement took over the party in Iowa and Minnesota and Nevada. There were uh, many victories like these across the country. And we, uh, we, we kind of really rattled the cages of the establishment on the national level, uh, so much so that <laughs> they're willing to spend millions of dollars to keep me out of Congress to this very day. But, uh, uh, but I think that if, if we wanna actually 
have an impact. If we want to actually uh, win races and and be able to actually change policy, then we've got to play to win, and we've got to use the vehicle that is the most effective to winning. And, and I see that being the Republican Party. Now, maybe there are certain circumstances where it's different. You know, we had a Libertarian Party candidate who got elected to the state house in Wyoming this this past year, uh, Marshall Burt. He's the first. Libertarian Party candidate elected to the state legislature in like a quarter century. And that's great. And that should be celebrated. And at the same time, as we got one LP victory, we got 100 and, well, 122 Re Liberty Republican victories. So I think it's kind of clear which, which, um, which vehicles, generally speaking, more effective to winning. Yeah. And, and obviously, I think strategy comes a little bit into play you guys at, at YAL have been focusing on local level races, not so much national races. And I would believe that there's a lot of people that would argue that uh, a local scale is far more important, at least in the interim, building up and, and having those coalitions at a local level and having the groundwork laid out for these candidates to prove themselves on a local level before it goes to a national level. Uh, yeah. Do you think that do you think it is more important to really worry about what's going on locally before you worry about what's going on federally? So I think a couple of things. Well, first of all, um, so the opportunity in, in going out and capturing these state legislative seats is is there, there's a couple points of value there. First of all, there is the point that you, that you hit on, which is that. The national leaders of tomorrow are the local leaders of today. We elect people to the state legislatures who are Liberty Ron Paul Republicans, and they prove themselves. They become champions for the grassroots people of the state, the grassroots conservative movement. Uh, they build a base of support, and then they can launch from there into federal, federal office in the future, potentially. Um, it's certainly it's a better strategy of trying to capture these federal seats than just people kind of just throwing people who don't have the credibility, who don't have the base of support, which is frankly what a lot of the liberty movement has been doing these last 10 years when we run people for federal office. We find some guy without any who nobody knows and they jump in and uh, sometimes it works out. Um, but actually, even the times where it did work out, um, they had some already built in base of support. You know, Thomas Massey, one of the greatest congressmen we have in Washington, D.C. right now, started off. Now, he wasn't a state legislator, but he he was elected uh, on the county level in his state. Uh, he had some elected office experience that gave him credibility to people. Justin Amash had served in his state legislature. Uh, now, Rand Paul, of course, is there in the Senate. He's a bit of an exception. But of course, you know, we don't all get to have the Paul last name. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and those those kind of connections there. But um but for the, so for the regular person, having that credibility of having served in local office makes you a more credible candidate running for higher office in the future. But of course, that's not the only value of getting people elected to the state legislature. In fact, I would argue that's even secondary. You know, if our enemy is, as Rand Paul branded it in 2016, the Washington machine, this apparatus of uh, government and corporate influences that are, you know, beating off the taxpayer trough, fighting never-ending wars, eroding our constitutional liberties, you know, centered around Washington, D.C. There's two strategies that we can pursue to try to defeat the Washington machine. We can do the direct assault, which is what we've been trying for 10 years, throwing people in, into federal races for, for president, for U.S. Senate, for Congress. We win a few you here or there, but you know what? We're going up against a very, very entrenched, uh, entrenched enemy, and uh, they defend those positions in the federal government with extreme viciousness and with a ton of money. And I've ex I've experienced that firsthand. So if you can't win on an, a direct assault, you need to go the indirect path, and the indirect path is to surround uh, the fortified enemy and to uh, cut off their supply chains, to cut off their resources. And we can do that by electing people to the state capitals, the state legislatures. We can elect people to state capitals across the country. And not only can we tackle tyranny on the state level, we can from the states tackle tyranny on the federal level through nullification, through things like the Defend the Guard Act, which is being pushed in states across the country right now, which would say, 
uh, the, have the states assert their authority that you can't send our, our, our state national guard off to war in foreign countries without a declaration of war. Uh, we can do things like um, uh, the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, refusing to comply with uh, unconstitutional um, violations of the Fourth Amendment on the state level. Uh, we can, uh, uh, we can, you know, there are states pushing the Second Amendment Preservation Act, saying we're not going to enforce federal gun control laws in our state. You could even start to mess with uh, the, you know, you could even start to fight back against the tax structure. With there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting I ideas on on how to do that with tax nullification. So if 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 we can't win the direct assault, we need to surround the enemy and we need to cut off the resources. And by going through the state legislatures, we can do exactly that. That's that's far more strategic than just uh, trying to overwhelm the system. I would say on on. You know, as you say, we get a handful of candidates on a national level. You can get your Rand Paul, you can get your your Thomas Massey in there, but if they don't have a coalition that's willing to work with them or or more like minded individuals up there working with them, then it's kind of you know it's kind yeah. of ineffective. Um, I, and, and and on top of that, I would add, you know, when we have a Rand Paul or a Thomas Massey or Justin Amash up there, you know, don't get me wrong, they do they do some great things. They're able to block some bad things. Um, and, but, but the real value is the bully pulpit is them being able to use the position to, to, to spread the message. Because of course, you know, uh, especially in the house of representatives, if you're just an average congressman, you don't have a lot of authority to change things. I mean, Nancy Pelosi won't even let people sponsor amendments on bills unless she, she uh, agrees to it. I, I would I would argue that the average uh, uh, state representative has more power to change policy than the average congressman, uh, and so uh, if we can kind of build a coalition across the many state capitals, uh, we can have a bigger influence on this country than than just uh, trying to uh, change things in, inside Congress. But I cut oh, you yeah. off. No, 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 no. You, I I thoroughly enjoyed what you just threw out there, and what I was going to say too is that. Uh, you know, on a, on a national scale, when we look at things, you can kind of see where uh, it, it breaks through in other states. It's it, like COVID-19 COVID and the lockdowns. Like we've seen how people are now so hot-eyed on Florida and South Dakota for not taking, you know, the more extreme measures and having their states shut down. Yeah, I, I've been, I, I think what we're seeing is, uh, uh, you know, and, and, you know, DeSantis in Florida, I think, has really uh, proven himself in a, in a lot of ways to, to have a bit of a, a spine of steel to stand up for, for, for what he knows is right. Because, yeah, the, the media, uh, everything, everything has just kind of, kind of conspired to try to make him uh, look like a terrible person for not, uh, for not taking people's freedoms away. And yet, at the end of the day, I think we're seeing the numbers and uh, things have turned. Uh, now uh, people are realizing what a terrible mess uh, New York State was. Um, these numbers that were being hidden in terms of nursing home deaths, and Florida's looking pretty good. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is a real victory of federalism, you know, decentralization, of uh, you know, states being able to make their own choices rather than being commanded by a national government, which is, uh, you know, what what the left these days really wants to see this country. Uh, they want to see, you know, Washington D.C. as a, uh, you know, uh, a top-down dictatorial system. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's that's what we're under right now, and we're seeing a lot of this with, uh, with what policies they're trying to push forward now. We have um, another coronavirus uh, aid bill that's on that's sitting on a desk that's trying to get things like fifteen dollars minimum wages added in. Uh, on top of things. And so when, yeah. when you look at that, when you look at the current administration and what's going on and kind of uh, kind of throw your view of the media in on this as well, because uh, I feel as though the media is extremely friendly to Joe Biden, whereas Donald Trump, if he flushed the toilet the wrong way, it would be a news story, you know, um, even if he flushed it the right way. Yeah. yeah even if he flushed it the right way. Um <laughs> That's 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 how it is, because now we're getting, you know, stories about how Joe Biden likes to put a, a log on the fire by himself. And, and that's a news story. <laughs> but yeah. uh, what, what do you think? 
is the fight ahead on on these things because the media obviously isn't going to be a, a good check or balance against it. It's just kind of trying to fluff it up instead of really yeah. challenging the administration. You know, I think the media, um, I, I've wondered these last few years, you know, if we had a totally state run media, like, uh, you know, like you've had in many totalitarian countries, how would it be any different than th what we've seen from the media these last few years? At least kind of, at least, uh, at least a totalitarian state media is, is, is somewhat honest in the fact that you, you, you know what their interest is. They're promoting the regime. And this corporate media is so intertwined with the, with the regime, with the Washington machine, but, but they're uh, less honest about it. Um, yeah, no, it's a real problem. But, uh, you know, I'm optimistic in the fact that I think in these last four years, uh, more people, I think, have kind of woken up to the corruption of the media than certainly at any point in my lifetime. I mean, I remember when, uh, when, when uh, these, uh, uh, you know, these big three cable news channels were just kind of monolithic. And uh, now we're seeing them all, we're seeing them get really desperate. I think the desperation comes from a, a place of recognizing that they're losing control of the narrative. There are so many alternative, uh, there's so much alternative media out there from, you know, podcasts to, you know, everything else that's available on the internet. Um, obviously there's misinformation out there, but there's, uh, um, but there's, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, truths out there that, you know, they haven't want us to have at one, haven't wanted us to have access to before. So I'm I'm encouraged that people are 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 distrustful of these um, these corporate media outlets, and um, it's an it makes it for an interesting time to be alive. Uh, no, absolutely, it does. And and I to speak to that, you're right. There's lots of alternative forms that are really taking off over traditional media. I mean, you know, I don't know how cable television still exists, honestly, but uh, and how those news networks are still. Uh, I, they're obviously clinging for life because uh, yeah. people don't get cable be, subscriptions anymore. They'll probably be gone within a generation. Yeah, more than likely, more than likely. And and obviously we've seen where the new mediums lie and, you know, things like things like a podcast, people like watching podcasts and, and uh, seeing people in long form media and interviews and things like that. So uh, interesting times for sure. And I, I, I agree and share in your optimism it's just sometimes the pessimism just outweighs it. Sometimes it's like looking at everything. It's like, oh crap, where do we, where, where are we really going to uh, start chipping away at stuff? But as you've, as you've laid out things like YAL local level uh, and, and local uh, tuning things on a local level definitely are, are proving some victories and that's good. And it's something to build off of. Yeah. Look, I, I ultimately think, uh, yeah, the, 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 the government establishment, the, the, the corporate media, I don't know, whatever you want to call this whole Washington machine. Yeah, it's, it's really cracking down on people in, in a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. But of course, in doing so, they're exposing themselves. They're exposing themselves to the people. The people can see what they are. That this is a uh, this is a this is a corrupt system built on force and coercion, um, and you know things are probably going to get messy in the near future. Uh, you know, uh, how much longer can this house of cards kind of keep standing when uh, they they've I mean they've literally uh, inflated the money supply by forty percent in the last year as they just print trillions and trillions of dollars and yeah. handed out like it's monopoly money. This isn't going to last forever. Uh, what comes next once this house of cards falls apart, that's what I'm interested in. And trying to do everything I can and to encourage others to do what they can uh, in the liberty movement to put us in the best position possible when that, when that moment happens of great change in our country. What can we do to be positioned to push us towards a free society and not towards the a more totalitarian society that many uh, that many would like us to move towards? And I think getting folks elected to the local levels, um, trying to get involved in state level politics, 
Uh, that's one thing that, that folks can do right now that is accessible and can make a real difference. Yeah, absolutely. So moving forward, uh, do, do, do you think that that's, that's the good plan to stick with is, is on that level, but also educating voters and letting them know, you know, what's going on, the best methods, what's being, you know, what, where the successes lay, do you think it, education plays a key in that as well? I certainly think that there's a, you know, value in, I guess, you know, by education, I guess it depends on what you mean. I think there's a value in kind of, you know, we always want to be getting out there and educating more people and trying to, you know, pull people out of the matrix so they can kind of, you know, see what our, uh, what our government system really is. It's not the Disney version that we were told in school. Um, but, um, but ultimately, uh, uh, you know, but ultimately, you know, there's always only going to be a small percentage of the public that really uh, cares about freedom and liberty and is willing to fight, fight for it. But you go, Go back to the American Revolution. You know, it started as you know three percent, right? You you only need a in an irate, tireless minority setting brush fires of liberty to to make things happen. So I think that we have that irate, tireless minority. We have been working at it. We've been making progress. We're getting people elected to the state legislatures. And I would tell any of your viewers or listeners who uh, want to make a difference for liberty, uh, I would say run for your local state legislature. Uh, when I ran for the state Senate, I was 20, 26 years old when I was elected. I never held elected office before. Nobody thought I had any chance. I ran against a 36-year Democrat incumbent who'd never lost a race, just went out there, knocked on doors, raised uh, grassroots uh, fund fundraising from the liberty movement, and won in a 20-point landslide. Again, I was just a Ron Paul liberty activist. There was nothing special about me. Um, and if I could do that, anyone could do it. Now, perhaps you're not someone who you're in a place in life where you can run for the state legislature, but that's fine. Look for other liberty people who can run and will run and support them. The place we can make change right now, the most, the most accessible place is to win these local state legislative races. Yep. What's, what, what's going on in your backyard? Absolutely. As a, you know, as Jordan Peterson would say, you know, make your bed before you try to save the world. Yeah, no, 100%. Eric, I, uh, I thank you for coming on. Uh, you, can you let my listeners know where they can find you and anything that you might be involved with uh, coming up? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Senator Brakey. You can also look me up on Facebook at just Eric Brakey. I guess I'm on Parlor and some of these other ones too, but I guess you can find me there. But I'm mostly active on Twitter these days. That's where you can find me. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about Young Americans for Liberty, you can go to yaliberty.org. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Pleasure's all mine. All right, guys. That was Eric Brakey. Go to his social links. They're down below. You've heard him. You've already heard him say them too. You know, you could have just written it down, typed it up. You could have done that while you listened or watched the podcast. You really could have. You could, you can multitask. It's possible. But I've provided them in the show notes down below because, you know, that's an important thing to me. Uh, that, that you be able to connect with some of the guests that I bring onto the show because, you know, these are the guys that I rely, I rely on being able to talk to these guys to message and add more content and depth to the conversation than just me sitting here talking to my walls. That's a little crazy. That's a little nutty. Uh, so, guys, you can follow me at FritzQS on Twitter, Facebook.com slash TheFritzCast. If you're on YouTube, you're already watching me. If you want to watch me on YouTube, search FritzCast. You'll find the channel and all the other interviews that we've done. We've done great interviews with guests like Larry Sharp, John Ziegler, Brad Palumbo, more coming out the wazoo. Angela McCardle actually is one of my... Uh, Angela, hello, hi, Mises Caucus, hey... Angela McArdle is actually one of the best episodes I've done lately. It's been on fire lately. So uh, you know, that's all I'm saying. You can go back and see some of the other episodes that have been done, and you can get ready and get excited for the episodes that are about to come. It's great. It's the best of, it's the best of both worlds, even though I told you last week that I hate that Van Halen album. But it's still beautiful. It's still the best of both worlds. You can get the old and the new. It's great. So one other thing that I ask one other thing one just one little thing I ask for you to do if you like the show if you like what you see um share it 
click the share button. It's it's somewhere down below on your phone, on your computer, whatever you're listening on. There's a share button there. Share it. Share it on your Twitter. Share it on your Facebook. Tag me if you want. I'll share. I'll retweet and share your tag. I'll give you a shout out. I don't. Any number of possibilities can happen. And then leave a review. You can leave a five star review. I'll accept a four star review. Three stars is. Uh, I gotta do better if you're giving me three stars. And then if you're that jerk that gave me one star, you know, I'll mock you if you give me a one star review. But it, if it's not a good one star review, if it's a dumb one star review, I will pick it apart and make fun of you. But anyway, do what you can do. It, it's free, it's easy, it takes about two seconds, and it helps grow the program. And those of you that have been out there doing it, it's been it's been working. That's all I'm saying. It's working. Okay, it's happening. I can't do it like Ron Paul would do it, but it's happening. Okay, that's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. So remember, I love you guys, and I'll see you guys next week. Next week is going to be the Joshua Smith episode, so brace yourselves because it's been crazy here on FritzCast. Lots of guests, lots of content, more coming. Love you guys.